Hello students. Today we are in chapter 4 looking at elasticity. So what elasticity means is how responsive the market is to various factors. That might sound kind of vague because there are lots of different elasticities just as there are lots of different factors that influence the market. The first one we'll look at is the price elasticity of demand. That's about how sensitive demand is to price changes. There's also the income elasticity. That's about how does demand respond to income. The cross price elasticity is about related goods. Recall that we talked earlier about substitutes and complements. Complements were things like hot dogs and hot dog buns. They go together. So cross price elasticity is about how sensitive is the hot dog market to changes in the bun market. It's also about substitutes like Macs and PCs. You buy a Mac or you buy a PC, but you don't buy both. So how does the market for Macs affect the market for PCs? That's also a question you can address with the cross price elasticity. There's also the price elasticity of supply. That's about how sensitive supply is to price. So that's our brief overview. Let's get started on the first one here, price elasticity of demand. So we say demand is elastic if it's sensitive to price. So in particular, if a small change in price gives you a big change in quantity demanded. So one example is restaurants. People are often very sensitive to restaurant prices. If restaurant food gets more expensive, I'll just cook at home instead. Your book mentions Honda cars as an example. If Honda tries to jack up their prices really high, I'll just buy a different brand instead. Or if carrots get expensive, we'll just substitute a different vegetable for carrots in our diet. Vacations, you don't really need to take a vacation. If that gets really expensive, you can just stay home instead, do something else. So all of these goods will be very sensitive, very responsive to price changes. So here's what a graph would look like for a good that has elastic demand. The slope is going to be fairly flat. You can see here that a small change in price, a small reduction in price, gives you this big increase in quantity demanded. So quantity is responding more than one for one. The opposite case is inelastic demand. This demand curve is not very sensitive to price. If price changes by a lot, quantity demanded doesn't do very much. So here, big price change from P0 to P1 only gives you a small increase in Q. So there are several examples of inelastic goods. So college textbooks. The deal is you buy a textbook or fail the class. Therefore, a textbook company can charge a price like $100 or $200, and you're still kind of stuck with it. Your demand is not very sensitive to the price of college textbooks. Healthcare also has inelastic demand. So I've never had the coronavirus, but I have had pneumonia, which is a pretty nasty respiratory illness. Options were go to the hospital or just die. So I went to the hospital and I paid them thousands and thousands of dollars. If they want to charge me a lot of money, I'd be willing to pay for it because I like being alive. Gas, also pretty inelastic. So your options are fill up your gas tank in your car or walking, then you're probably going to put gas in your car unless the price is really, really ridiculous. But even then, you'll probably still be getting gas. So there's not a lot of options to switch away from gas. So there are many examples of goods that you're familiar with that are inelastic and several that are elastic. elastic. 
So the most extreme cases are perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic. Um, it's hard to really think of an example that really is perfectly elastic or perfectly inelastic, but this extreme case can help clarify your thinking a bit. So with perfectly elastic demand, demand is perfectly sensitive to price. If you change the price by even just one cent higher, people just don't buy at all. They buy zero. With perfectly inelastic demand, the price could go up from one dollar to a million dollars, and people still buy just as much as they were before. Again, hard to think of a real example of that, but it's just an extreme case to help clarify your thinking. So there are some common factors that influence how elastic or how inelastic demand is going to be. One of them is substitutes. Is there a close substitute for this good or not? That can be an important factor. If a good has a lot of close substitutes, its demand will be quite elastic. If a good is very unique though, and you don't have anything that's similar to it, then you're kind of stuck buying it, and it's going to have a more inelastic demand. So restaurants are very substitutable. You have to eat, but that could be restaurant food or it could be food at home. Food at home is a good substitute for restaurant food. That's going to make demand very elastic for restaurants. It's also going to restrict the restaurant's ability to raise their prices. I mentioned that Honda cars are an example of a good that has elastic demand. Honda is far from the only brand out there that makes cars, so if they try to jack up their price, you'll just buy from Toyota or from Ford instead. Carrots, you can switch from carrots to broccoli or to something else, so if carrot farmers want to make carrots really, really pricey, it's going to backfire on them. People will just stop buying carrots, they'll buy some other kind of veggie instead. Now on the other side, college textbooks are very inelastic. Now you're thinking perhaps that there are lots of other econ textbooks out there, and there are. However, only one of them, the one by Kapik and Matir, second edition, is suitable for this course. So for textbooks that are suitable for the class you're taking, there aren't any close substitutes. So lack of close substitutes gives you inelastic demand. Now, mystery novels are a good where there's lots of close substitutes. A lot of them follow a very similar plot. So someone dies at the beginning, and then the person you least expect is guilty at the end. Lots of authors follow that formula. So if one author tries to make their books super expensive, it's going to backfire. You'll switch the buying from a different author. Healthcare, not really a lot of close substitutes there. If you have pneumonia, it's go to the hospital or die, and dying is not really a good substitute, so inelastic demand. So we saw that substitutability matters. Another factor that influences elasticity is how big is it? as a share of your budget. So one of your big expenses as a college student is paying the rent. As a result, a relatively modest change in your rent is going to have a fairly big impact on your budget. As a result, you care a fair amount about what your rent is and you'll be responsive to it in your demand. If your landlord tries to raise the rent by $100 a month, you probably won't just take it. You'll probably just start, start shopping for apartments somewhere else. That makes demand elastic for apartments. On the other end of the spectrum, you have toothpaste. So one tube of toothpaste lasts you quite a while. When you do buy it, it's a small, small, small fraction of your budget. If toothpaste makers want to double their price for toothpaste, I probably wouldn't really be that upset. 
I'd probably still buy it. So that can have inelastic demand. Time is also a factor. So in general, demand gets more elastic over time. In the short run, it can be hard to make adjustments and a substitute for a similar good. In the long run, though, it's a different story. You have more time to adapt. So the classic example is gas. So if they suddenly raise gas prices because of some political turmoil in oil producing countries or something, you still got to get to work, still got to get to class. Well, I guess this is an entirely online class, so man, that last part is not quite so applicable. Perhaps some of you who are working are working from home, so that part might not have been terribly applicable either. Um, let's see. In normal times, people used to drive to school and drive to work. So back then, demand for gas might have been very inelastic because you couldn't really change that quickly. You still had to get to work even if gas were expensive. In the long run, though, you have more flexibility. So maybe in a short run, you're stuck with your lease for your apartment that's far from campus. Long run, though, if you think gas is going to be a big expense for you, you can switch to a new apartment that's close to campus. Once your lease expires, you find a new apartment that's more suitable for you. You're probably stuck with your current car for a while. However, eventually you're going to want to trade your car in and get something newer. When you do that and you're worried about gas prices, you might decide to go for a car that's more fuel efficient and you'll be buying less gas. It's another way you can adapt in the long run in a way that you could not do in the short run. So that's how you look at elasticity conceptually. In our next episode, we'll look at the math behind the price elasticity of demand.